Hello and welcome to another video for Synoptic Gospels Online at Life Pacific University. Uh, I'm your professor Ryan Litton. Today we're going to be talking about eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. Uh, our attempt to understand this topic of eschatology will focus on the kingdom of God, starting in the Old Testament and moving into the New. The phrase kingdom of God doesn't really appear in the Old Testament. But this doesn't mean that the concept itself is absent. So what we're going to do in order to understand the Old Testament view of the concept is examine uh, two ideas that are clearly mentioned in the Old Testament. One of them is the coming of the Lord, the coming of Yahweh, and the day of Yahweh, or the day of the Lord. For kingdom of God in the Old Testament, we have several questions that we need to ask to kind of tease out um, this idea of the day of the Lord and what is what happens when Yahweh comes. And so we want to ask, what does it look like uh, when Yahweh comes? Why does he come? What is the day of the Lord like? What should Israel and her enemies expect when he comes? Do the day of the Lord texts refer to specific historical events? What happens after the day of the Lord? And how is the new covenant related to the day of the Lord? So, what does it look like when Yahweh shows up? Well, Psalm 18, 7 and 8, The earth reeled and rocked, the foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Psalm 98, 7 and 8, Let the sea roar, let the floods clap their hands. Micah 1, 4, Then the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will burst open. Isaiah 64, 1-3, mountains would quake as when fire kindles brushwood, the mountains quaked at your presence. And so we see here, when Yahweh shows up, uh, there's some cataclysmic events. This is not something that you, um, not something that you want to take lightly. Okay. So now, why? Why does he come? Well, he comes in response to the cry of his people, Psalm 18, 6, to my God I cried for help. He comes in uh, remembrance to the covenant, Psalm 98.3. He has remembered his steadfast love. He comes to bring deliverance, Psalm 18 and Isaiah 63 and Isaiah 35. Um, he comes to rule and to judge. We can see this in Deuteronomy 33, Psalm 98, Micah 1, Isaiah 26, and Isaiah 35. He comes to cleanse and to restore, Micah 1 and Isaiah 35. And then he comes to reestablish order and justice. And so this is a cataclysmic event, and it comes, uh, it seems, for the benefit of his people uh, to establish uh, the proper order of things uh, for his people. And so what is this day like? What is the day of the Lord like? Well, it's described as terror, day of terror in Isaiah 2. It's described as a day of darkness in Amos, Joel, and Zephaniah. It seems to produce... Uh, it seems to be accompanied by destruction of the land and its produce in Joel chapter 1. There's images of fire and warfare used in Joel 2 and Malachi 4. Uh, we again find references to cataclysmic events in Joel 2 and in Zephaniah 1. And the parallels in the uses of images like warfare, fire, darkness, and cataclysmic events suggest that there's a link between the coming of Yahweh and the day of the Lord. It seems like when uh, Yahweh shows up that that is, in fact, the day of the Lord. This seems like maybe it's obvious, but we want to make sure that we're, we're doing our careful work here. And so it seems like there's a clear connection between these two things. So what should Israel and her enemies expect when this happens? Well, the proud and the haughty, both in Israel and beyond, can expect destruction. We see this in Isaiah, Zephaniah, and in Malachi. There will be destruction of idols and idol worship, both in Israel and beyond, again in Isaiah and Zephaniah. A shaking will take place that will purge the people of Israel, leaving a righteous remnant. This is in, uh, in uh, Amos. Uh, and uh, one, who, one will come who will turn their hearts, speaking of Israel specifically, uh, back to God. So it seems like the day of the Lord is to bring about a change in the world where disobedience was to be eradicated and Israel is to be purified. So. What happens after the day comes? Well, after the day, justice flows like a river and righteousness abounds. You see this in Amos and Malachi. The day will bring restoration to the Davidic line, the return of Israel's king. This is Amos chapter 9. 
the day of the Lord brings destruction on the land and its produce, as well as exile. Uh, but after that day, Israel is restored to the land with its blessings. Amos chapter 9, Joel chapter 2. And there's a universal blessing on Israel, Joel chapter 2, including the pouring out of, of God's Spirit. So all who call on the name of the Lord will find deliverance, according to Joel chapter 2. So, this is the survey to the uh, in the Old Testament. Now, in, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, we want to see how does the day of the Lord relate to the New Covenant? How do these connect to one another, or do they? Well, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 are the quintessential passages in the Old Testament for the New Covenant. They picture a time uh, when restoration will take place. This seems uh, to be one that occurs after the plucking up caused by exile uh, that they are witness to. And here we find references to the covenant at Sinai while speaking of a new covenant. We should recall that images from Sinai, the shaking of the earth, uh, were used to describe God's day and the coming of Yahweh. So this suggests that there's some kind of connection here. The new covenant also seems to be associated with the giving of God's spirit to his people. So this parallels Joel's statement. It would seem then that the similarities between the aftermath of the day of the Lord and the new covenant point to the idea that the day of the Lord, or at least a day, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, was to usher in the new covenant. And so it seems like there's a connection uh, between uh, Yahweh's arrival, the day of the Lord, and the new covenant. Now, Yahweh arrives on the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord initiates the new covenant. It seems like that's consistent with what we've seen in the Old Testament so far. So do the day of the Lord text refer to specific historical events? Well, if we look at Amos 5, it appears that Amos sees the day of the Lord as the northern kingdom's exile into Assyria. It's not easy to determine what Joel's referring to. Uh, some think uh, he's picturing the coming of a cloud of locusts using the imagery of an army, while others think he is picturing the coming of an army using the imagery of a locust. And so is he using locusts to illustrate an army or an army to illustrate locusts? We're not, we're not sure. Uh, either way, he appears to be relating the day to an event that takes place in history. Zephaniah seems to be referring to the exile of Judah by Babylon. And then Malachi, who writes after the return from exile in Babylon, still pictures the day of the Lord. So then to summarize uh, our First Testament, Old Testament, Hebrew Bible perspectives here, uh, the relationships we've seen so far suggest a few things. We should probably see the day of the Lord as the coming of Yahweh. When we refer to the day of the Lord, that's when Yahweh shows up. Since uh, the coming of Yahweh involves the coming of a king to deliver and establish justice, the day of the Lord also pictures the coming of the king to deliver and establish justice and righteousness. So the new covenant was pictured as a time when deliverance and restoration would, would happen, and so it seems to be related to Yahweh's reign. So we should think of the day of the Lord as an establishment of God's kingdom in, in some tangible way. There's a problem here, though. Uh, the Old Testament seems to identify at least four events and one that is to come as a day of the Lord. And so how do we how do we understand this? Well, this is one of those things that is, is easy to miss, uh, but it's really important for understanding Old Testament prophecy. And uh, really understand uh, it's really important for understanding um, uh, eschatology and, and New Testament prophecy as well. Um, so first, let's let's diagram what we see in terms of the different days of the Lord. Okay, uh, so uh, what we have in each case is uh, we have a day of the Lord that is an event in the immediate history of the people or which waits to occur in history, which is Malachi's day. And so what we have is this progress of history. We have Amos, we have Joel, we have Zephaniah, and we have Malachi. Each of these prophets seems to have pictured his day as bringing about a restoration, but elements of the restoration seem to be left unfulfilled. And this is to the point that Malachi, after the exile, can still picture a future day that will bring this. And so how do we how do we reconcile this? Um, are they just each wrong? Um, well, I mean, that's that's one interpretive option, but that's, that's not the option that we're going to take. So uh, in the second temple period, which is the period uh, sometimes called intertestamental period, we want to avoid that terminology because it privileges the New Testament over the Old Testament, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'll often refer to the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible or as the First Testament. So we don't want to make it sound like the New Testament is uh, elevated in some sense and the Old Testament is denigrated. Uh, it also privileges Christianity over Judaism. So, so we refer to it as the Second Temple period. This is uh, the period of the Second Temple up to the point that it's destroyed in 70 AD. 
during this time, there's a number of changes to Jewish thinking. Uh, think about what it would be like to be under foreign rule for the better part of 600 years. Uh, one thing that happens during this period is that we begin to see references to the kingdom of God. Israel wants their king to come and rule and end foreign occupation. Um, they're in this pattern of exile and return. This is uh, how uh, religion uh, scholar Stephen Prothero characterizes Judaism as the way of exile and return. So they have this experience of exile and return, and now they're in the land and experiencing exile within their land. And so they want God to bring his kingdom and rid their land of uh, foreigners. We need to look at some of these references and see if there's any relationship between what is described and what we determined about the Day of the Lord text. If there is, then our conclusion that the Day of the Lord relates to the coming of the kingdom of God is affirmed. So, is the kingdom of God described in similar ways to the Day of the Lord? Well, in the Assumption of Moses, now this is a Second Temple uh, work, this isn't a canonical work, it's not in the New Testament or the Old Testament. Uh, God is going to arise from his royal th throne and establish his reign. The text uses cataclysmic imagery to, de to describe the event, uh, much like the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible. First Enoch pictures God as a king who will visit the earth with goodness and bring vengeance upon his enemies. Enemies include Satan, based on the Assumption of Moses. And uh, there will be a judgment that takes place. The Psalms of Solomon refer to a restoration of the son of David, the messianic king from the line of David, and the destruction of Israel's enemies, the unrighteous and the prideful. Based on these limited texts, and this is a limited survey, <laughs> there's a lot of Second Temple texts, we do see some similarities. There are royal images and cataclysmic images used. There's deliverance from enemies that's accomplished, the Davidic line is restored, and the unrighteous and the prideful are removed. Are there differences? Well, there are several. Whereas the Old Testament events were thought of as occurring in the immediate history of the prophets, the Second Temple texts picture the event as belonging to the last days, the end of history. They don't seem to be referring to multiple days, but to one day that involves cataclysmic events that bring about a complete alteration in history. God is seen as more removed from actual involvement in history. He acts through intermediaries like angels rather than directly entering history. He's transcendent above creation. And the enemies now go beyond national enemies to spiritual enemies like Satan and supernatural powers. So why do we have these differences? Well, there's a growing pessimism about the world at this point. Uh, they'd been restored to the land, uh, but the promised restoration hadn't come in the way it was described. They're ruled over by a foreign nation, as we mentioned. Many saw the priesthood as corrupt, and thus the nation's devotion to Yahweh was not pure. Sin, sickness, and Satan dominated the world, and God didn't seem to be doing anything about it. And the spirit that was promised was nowhere to be found, since there was no prophetic voice. This led to a radical change in the way people viewed the coming of the kingdom of God. When it came, the present flow of history was going to have to be completely altered. Something new put in its place. They saw this new thing as the kingdom of God. So let's, let's chart this out. We have this idea of the present evil age in the march of history, and then we have the day of the Lord, and then we have the kingdom of God. And so the idea is that we current inhabit, currently inhabit the present evil age, that the day of the Lord will come, and then we'll experience the kingdom of God. That, that's, that's the perspective. So in the present evil age, we have sin, we have Satan ruling, we have Israel dominated by our enemies, we have the wicked prospering, we have sickness, and there is no presence of God with his people. But in the kingdom of God, there's forgiveness, there's victory over Satan and supernatural forces, enemies are crushed, and the Messiah rules, and the righteous prosper, sickness will be no, no more, and the Spirit of God is present. So, now we want to look at the New Testament, and we want to say, does Jesus use themes that are in keeping with the contemporary ideas about the kingdom of God. Remember, these second temple works are contemporary to Jesus, and so these are the same kind of ideas that people around Jesus would be thinking. And so is Jesus consistent with them or not? 
Jesus seems to make the kingdom of God concern, the renewal of Israel, and pictures it, pictures it as related to the people being baptized by the Spirit. We see this in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, the kingdom of God is associated with power over demons and the destruction of Satan as a chief enemy. We get this across all three of the synoptics. Uh, there are some cataclysmic images associated with the kingdom, uh, especially in Mark 13. And Luke's gospel links the kingdom and salvation. Zechariah mentions that God has raised up a mighty savior in the house of David who would deliver Israel from her enemies, providing forgiveness of sin. There's also a reversal to the present situation. The kingdom involves good news proclaimed to the poor, release for captives, healing for the blind, and freedom from oppression. The poor are blessed, but the rich receive woe. The children, those least in social status, are the model for those who seek to enter the kingdom of God. All of these seem to be consistent with Second Temple ideas. It seems like Jesus is more or less in step with what other people are saying around the same time. So what else in the, the rest of the New Testament? What about in Acts? Well, Acts 1 starts with a question about whether Jesus is about to restore the kingdom of God. They ask Jesus this explicitly in um, Acts chapter 1, and Jesus tells them in Acts 1-7, it's not for you to know uh, when I'm going to be doing these things. Uh, the following scene is the ascension in most of the ancient world. The coronation of a king was pictured as an ascent up a mountain to the throne. That may well be what's implied here, particularly given the reference to Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in Acts 2-32. Immediately after this, Peter is found addressing the need to restore the number of the twelve. This seems to be related to the idea that the twelve represent the restored tribes of Israel. So after Peter had asked about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, we see Israel being restored. And then in Acts 2, we, we find Peter linking Jesus to the Davidic Messiah, but transcending David as the one who has not seen decay. He has been raised up, while this could be referred, uh, this could be referring to his raising from the dead. The most immediate raising was the ascension. And this is in keeping with the idea that Jesus is now at the right hand, pouring out the Spirit as the king's coronation gift to his people. So what brought about this change in perspective? Well, there are several influences, not the least of which was the experience of exile in Babylon and Persian ideas uh, that were encountered there. Uh, one key influence, however, is the rise of apocalypticism. Uh, your reading covers this in more detail, and so you feel free to explore that. But this movement seems to have lost the telescopic, looking at, uh, a telescopic rather, uh, looking at multiple events as one uh, view of the Old Testament prophets and focused on a radical break between two ages. The dualism was perhaps influenced by Persian ideas like Zoroastrianism and, and the like. Um, they held a pessimistic view of history, such that a new age must be established. The world was too far gone and needed something cataclysmic to happen. They assumed that Israel was essentially righteous and God had not intervened. Thus, the only thing to do was to wait for God to break in and in a single event, radically transform the world. The heavenly world and the earthly world are completely contrasted in this. Well, so how, how should we understand this? Jesus seemed to have accepted some of this, but not all of it. Um, he seems to have accepted uh, the idea of two ages, and so, uh, but but there's some significant differences, and so we can kind of picture it like this: uh, so have the same march of history. We have clearly we have a present evil age, and we have Jesus showing up. Then we have this kingdom of God and present evil age overlapping. Uh, Jesus tells us that the kingdom is here, but also clearly the kingdom has not yet fully come because there's still the present evil age. And then Jesus will come again. And at that point, the present evil age will be fully done away with. And so what we have here is sort of an overlap. This is uh, why it's called inaugurated eschatology. The kingdom of God is inaugurated, but it is not yet fully here. Um, the idea is that um, it's begun. We can see the kingdom of God. We can participate in the kingdom of God. But it has not yet fully overcome the, the present evil age. And so we still see evil things, even though we also still see parts of the kingdom. Like Second Temple thought, Jesus sees a present evil age and kingdom of gods that are uh, kingdom of God that are opposites of each other. With his coming, though, the kingdom of God is broken into the world. 
It does not completely transform the world. It exists in an overlap with the present evil age. And so Jesus, the Son of Man, will come again, and that will usher in the age to come the kingdom of God. This is uh, what we speak of as the now and not yet. Uh, already, but not yet. Uh, the kingdom of God is here, but not fully here. Okay, So this is inaugurated eschatology. You can see this in the worker Greg Beale, uh, George Eldon Ladd, lots of New Testament scholars. Uh, fully on board with this idea of inaugurated eschatology. It's been, been very helpful in interpreting the New Testament. So some conclusions on this. Well, Old Testament ideas about the coming of Yahweh and the day of the Lord pictured uh, the establishment of God's reign in a restored just society where the Davidic line is reestablished and God's spirit is poured out. The Old Testament prophets seem to have pictured multiple days that referred to the events in the immediate future of Israel and Judah. None of these events fully brought about the day of the Lord, since we find Malachi speaking about a future day. The pessimism caused by foreign oppression and the absence of the prophetic voice, in the sense that the promised restoration had not yet occurred, led to a change in perspective during the Second Temple. It's during this influence uh, that apocalyptic ideas, uh, there is a focus on a single day in which God will do away with the present evil age and radically replace it with his kingdom of God. One point here about the Old Testament prophets that I think is helpful is they are seeing a day of the Lord. They're just not seeing the final day of the Lord. And so when Amos sees a day of the Lord, there is a sense in which Yahweh shows up on that day and it is partially fulfilled. And this is one of the difficulties with prophecy is that sometimes it's fulfilled in part and then fulfilled again later. And we see this with the Messiah. Uh, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament are fulfilled in their immediate context, but then also fulfilled again later. Uh, there are prophecies about the Messiah that are fulfilled in David. David is an anointed one, therefore he is a Mashiach, uh, a Messiah. But he is not everything that is the Messiah. He's not the final fulfillment of the Messiah. So some implications for this. To paraphrase Lad, we have the kingdom being present, but we see it without full consummation. We await the not yet of the final day that manifests the kingdom of God in all of its glory. Blessings of the kingdom of God are available to those of us who enter the kingdom now. Yet the blessings we receive now are just the first fruits of what is yet to come, when the kingdom of God is finally manifested. There's a current victory over spiritual powers, but Satan still exists. And here the other spiritual powers, are, they're, while they're defeated enemies, they're also still doing things, right? And so there's this tension. Of they're defeated, but they're still here, right? They're still around. And we look forward to a future day when this world will truly be changed. And so there's a sense in which we are still apocalyptic, that we still believe that there will be this future event that will set everything right. And this is partially, I mean, this is the answer to the problem of evil. You know, people say, if God's so good, why hasn't he put uh, an end to all evil? Well, he, he will. Uh, and just not on your timetable. <laughs> uh, he's going to, right? And so this is an enduring hope. This is something, uh, you know, we are not left without God's dynamic present. Uh, presence here in the present. Um, his kingdom is evident uh, because his spirit is active in and through us. And uh, this this is really just key for understanding the New Testament. You know, that we, you know, Jesus in John 14 says, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house, right? So we have this, uh, you know, Jesus has accomplished things for us and gone ahead. And so we're living in this in-between where he's preparing the place for us. And so we're not there yet, but we're also uh, united to him by the Spirit. And so there's this, you know, in between already, but not yet. So so this is just a really helpful perspective for eschatology. I know eschatology is kind of a, a thorny topic. There's a lot of other things that we could cover here, but, you know, just really want you to kind of grab a hold of this inaugurated eschatology of LAD and uh, use that as a framework to help you uh, as you, you try to understand this, this uh, doctrine of the last things.